decided to teach tonight um, <clears throat> because I've had CSB, I've got district board meetings, different things, and I didn't want to have three weeks go by because uh, this is a good series. We're talking about Proverbs chapter 4 is our uh, theme, to get wisdom and get understanding. Uh, later in verse 7, he said, wisdom's the principal thing, get wisdom. With all thy getting, get understanding. And then, of course, Luke 24 and 45, uh, we're on the road to Emmaus, and he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. You know, as we go along in our walk with God, our understanding should increase over time. And so whenever we're discussing prophecy, I think it's always important. Uh, as I've said before, I, I'm always amused by people that teach prophecy in such an adamant, uh, you know, way that I'm not sure. I'm just so sure that I'm, I'm teaching prophecy is that this is how I see it as of kind of right now. <laughs> Amen. And we started a series. My title slide should have been up already, folks. <laughs> We started a series um, a little bit ago, and tonight is part three of globalization and the new world order, what I'm calling the Star Trek effect, uh, where we get into one planetary uh, type of a thing. Tonight's part three, and uh, I'm just going to teach until we uh, our normal dismissal time, and then we'll just you know, pick this up at a, at a later time. Would you lift your voice up and pray? In Jesus' name, Father, I thank you. For your mercy and your grace. I'm asking you in Jesus' name, touch the session tonight. <clears throat> Praise God. <clears throat> and everybody said amen. <clears throat> Shake hands with two or three people and bless them in the name of the Lord. And you may be seated. Everybody said amen. If I could give a quick note, they handed me a note uh, they forgot to mention earlier. Uh, to those of you in the Silver Eagles, this Sunday morning is your monthly breakfast that you have at 8.30. And we have a local attorney that's going to be with us uh, in that session to talk about wills and so forth. So that's a great session to be in. <clears throat> and uh, everybody said amen. <laughs> Even though we want to live... But we need to plan for that eventual day. And uh, here's the, the one thing. I, I want you to go with me to the book of Revelation, uh, the first chapter. Um, all of these prophecies, and, and, and I think it's important to understand, even about the book of Revelation, a great deal of Daniel and Revelation and things that we call prophecy, a great deal of it is really about Israel. And not near as much uh, about the church. Now there obviously is prophetic things that refer to the church, but there is much more that refers to Israel. Of course, the church uh, has been engrafted in, uh, in a spiritual sense, and so we, we have roles to play. But Revelation chapter 1, just verse 19, I think we ended with this in the last session. Uh, write the things, the Spirit of the Lord told John, write the things which thou hast seen. Everybody say seen. And the things which are. Right? Amen. <laughs> and the things which shall be hereafter. I now thee wed thee in Jesus' name. <laughs> so there are three things that he was going to say. He, he said, I want to show you some things, and I want you to write this down. I'm going to show you, John, things that are, or things that, that are seen. That's, that is mostly the things that is uh, a, a recorded in chapter 1. And it has to do with established things, past established truths. And then he said, I'm going to show you things which are. That's the things that are as of right now. This is in John's time. Most of that seems to be recorded 
basically in chapters 2 and 3. In those chapters, it has to do with the seven churches of Asia Minor, which we know were seven actual existing churches that not only uh, represented what they were in real time, but also had a, uh, an application to prophetical things, which finally was the third thing. He said, which things shall be. And it appears that for the most part, from chapters 4 all the way to the end of chapter 22, it is dealing with futuristic events that John saw in his vision. And again, it mostly has to do with Israel. Now, the historistic doctrine uh, that I've mentioned before notes and uh, says that they don't believe it's futuristic, but rather it's historic. It was all fulfilled by the time 70 AD came. However, there's, there's, there's problem with that. And, and by the way, the reason that doctrine would come, because we went 2,000 years, or 1,900 years at least, without any new prophetic unfoldings. And so, you know, we don't see things for a while. We start trying to come up with reasons to explain it. However, uh, we know that John did not write the book of Revelation until about 95 A.D., which is about 25 years after um, uh, General Titus rode into Jerusalem. So I believe this is not historic, but rather it is a revealing of Jesus Christ about the future. Now, why is that important? Because prophecy cleans up all of the ongoing issues that had their questions that have been started in the book of Genesis that all throughout history we, we wouldn't understand how many things make sense how many times have we said well we don't know why God does this why does he allow that why this why that well I, I believe the Lord gave us some understanding of how he's going to wrap all this up to understand that it's all going to be tied up by the time he's done God started this process with Israel all the way back in the 12th chapter of Genesis when he visited upon Abram and said, I'm going to make a, a new nation out of you, and he's going to finish the story. But of course, the story lasted much longer than Abram's lifetime. And the story includes the church, though we were engrafted in at a later time. But we, we sort of became a part of Israel's history, at least in a spiritual sense. Uh, but it's, it's still the unfolding of the natural Israel. Now again, because Israel was, uh, I'm sorry, well yeah, Israel was destroyed in 70 AD and 1900 years went by uh, without a resurrection, that, that brought the idea that, well, okay, this, this is just not going to happen. It must be a historical event. But all of that should have been put aside in 1948 when miracle of miracles occurred and the bones lived again. I mean, and and no other nation has this happened like this. It's powerful. We've taught on all this before. But and, And here's the thing. The things that I'm talking about tonight are not really in too much uh, debate. I'm teaching some classic... Uh, end time type of stuff. The only thing that's debatable in it all is the timing of the rapture of the church. Whether it's coming a little earlier, whether it's coming later, and we'll get into that uh, later and we'll talk more about it. But I want to recap one thing that is uh, pretty much not in dispute by most scholars that study this stuff, and that is this. There's a few things we know. We know that when in Daniel's 70th week, it will begin with a peace treaty. Now we know that. And uh, one of these nights I'm going to teach perhaps a Bible study on what are the things that need to be in that peace treaty because, you know, Lord knows there's been plenty of them that's been tried. As a matter of fact, every president in my lifetime has been trying to solve that Middle East problem. And this week, as you heard in the news, the Trumpster rolled out his effort (laughs) uh, that got shot down pretty quick. The truth of the matter is there's been a lot of great efforts to solve the Middle East problem. And I remember even back when uh, Bill Clinton was president and he spent weeks 
in uh, Camp David with Yasser Arafat and Menachem Begin and uh, I think it was Begin and, and anyway back in those days he was so frustrated they interviewed him and, and Clinton has even noticed that he said he's so frustrated he said it doesn't matter what we say Arafat just says no to everything <laughs> you can't negotiate with somebody that just says no to everything <laughs> well the question is why I would tell you that Despite all the best efforts of government and all the best efforts of presidents, it really is not going to happen until it's time. And it's not going to happen without spiritual assistance. Because this is a spiritually driven thing. You can't make Bible prophecy happen quicker than it's scheduled. God can, but we can't. And so we know the 70th week will begin with the treaty. We know that the Antichrist will take full absolute control by the three and a half year mark. He'll enter into the temple. The Bible calls it the abomination of desolation. We know that the second coming of Jesus occurs at the end of the tribulation, which will be the battle of Armageddon. And again, the, 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 the issue of debate is whether the the rapture of the church and the coming of the Lord is, is going to happen at the same time or is it going to happen at separate times? But when I say the coming of the Lord Jesus, I'm not referring at the moment to the, to the rapture. I'm talking about when the Lord comes to set the, the world in order and uh, begin the millennial reign. We know the millennial reign begins immediately after that. And all of this is, is telling the story of what's going to unfold with Israel. Because God owes it to the world to finish the story that he started. And he gave us a glimpse. And by the way, this isn't written to the lost world. This is written to the church. You and I in the church need to be uh, understanding that, that these things are... I even wonder sometimes, you know, there's a lot of smart people uh, that don't walk with God. And I, I even wonder sometimes, do they ever read this stuff and, and, and purposely, because they want to mock, do they purposely try to gear things to fit? I don't know. But whether they mean it or not, they keep doing things that fit. And, and, but, but they don't see it, probably. But the church is supposed to see it. Bring up slide two. Remember, <clears throat> the beast of Daniel 7, there were several, uh, seven different kingdoms or seven different beasts. By the time John saw it, which is this picture you're looking at in the book of Revelation, he saw one beast with seven heads. Now that means that the seven, the seven kingdoms are going to come together as one kingdom in the end. Now, remember, the greatest barrier to world government that has always been throughout history is the issue of language. <clears throat> Man first tried this one world attempt back at Babel in Genesis 11. And God noted that when their language became as one, they could accomplish anything they put their mind to do. But he put a stop to it. And he did not approve their one world efforts. I would tell you it's because it wasn't time. But bring up Revelation 13. So let's read again verse 2. And remember what, the, what, what John says about the beast. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. In other words, the body. His feet were the feet of a bear. His mouth the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So this thing is antichrist driven at the end. This is the type and style of government that will be in place at the coming of the Lord. Now, the final kingdom has seven heads, but notice he said it had a mouth of a lion. And that's interesting to me because what it's saying is, is that though this will be a uh, consortium of kingdoms, it will only have one language. It will speak the language of the lion, which is Great Britain or England. So a global language is going to have to come about in order for this to happen. 
it's interesting that the previous former uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, many of you know who he is, I want to quote you a statement that he issued during his uh, leadership. He said, the world community has made the decision that English is the global language. Now that's, and this is what I mean when I say, I wonder if these guys read this <laughs> and, and, and think, you know, hey, let's have some fun with the Christians and, 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 and do stuff making them think it's the end times. <laughs> I don't know. I, it's, it's a marvel to me because when you study this stuff, if it doesn't cause the hairs on the back of your neck to rise up a little here and there, there's something wrong with you. This should stir you up. By the way, that's why even now, if you are an international pilot or an international operator, you have to speak English, even if it's a second language. So the mouth of the lion has been established. The structure is in place. God revealed all of this to spark our faith, to prepare us, uh, because I believe, I'm going to say something tonight, I believe it's rapture season, which... I've been saying for a long time, but I really thought about it this afternoon as I was studying this, and I, I think I can stand and say that we are the generation of whom the ends of the world are come. And I don't say that lightly. Now, every generation has thought that they're the, you know, they're, they're it. They're going to wrap it up. I'm not even necessarily talking about the end of the church age. I'm talking about... I see this stuff unfolding so fast since the beginning of the 20th century. I believe it's going to be fulfilled in the 21st century. And so I believe we are that generation, he said, of whom the ends of the earth are come. Another step in all this globalization process that we got going on is happening right here in America, and it's the Real ID Act. It was signed into law by... President Bush back in 2005, and it was a direct reaction to 9-11. And the Real ID Act goes into full effect, as many of you know, October 1st of this year. And, uh, man, some of you that have been on Facebook saw my little event. I had my own uh, aggravation with it, trying to get things accomplished. I don't think it's the mark of the beast. That's not what I'm telling you, but it is stepping toward it. All the stuff that they gather eventually will be used for it. But uh, you will not be able to fly on a domestic flight after October of this year if you do not have your driver's license upgraded to the real ID level. And it's interesting that what started all of this was a reaction to terror. If you want to get people to do things that they wouldn't normally do, just blow something up. Really, put fear in them. And they'll throw down common sense in order to feel safe. And, uh, and that's what's happening with a lot of this effort to disarm America. Uh, and the gathering of all this data. and all, It's all these mass shootings and stuff. They didn't have, this wasn't going on when I was a kid. This has all been happening in the last 25 years or so. And, and it's picking up and it's picking up. Now I'm going to tell you, it's going to keep up until the will of the American people breaks. That's what this is about. And uh, it's, it's interesting it, 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 because we react and we overreact. And we want to pass a bunch of laws sometimes that ain't even going to make a bit of difference. I would tell you that, that we have that big fight going on in, in our own state capital right now. And the whole nation is watching it. And the interesting thing is, most everything that they're wanting to pass, for example, we had a mass shooting here next door in Virginia Beach. And not one gun law that, that was in place, nor any that they're putting into effect, uh, would have affected or stopped it from happening. I'm going to say it's not going to ever stop them from happening. You can't do it. And though most all, except for a, 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 a small handful of the damage is done with handguns, um, they're, they're wanting desperately to get the a a a ARK-15s out of operation. But that's not the problem. Nobody's using them to, 
to, to kill people. There, there was one uh, issue with that guy out in Nevada. But aside from that, those not to, and so I'm asking myself the question, why are we so rabid about going after things that are not even the problem? I would tell you the spirits and the people that are driving all this could care less about the mass shootings. And all. That's not their goal. Their goal is to set the, the culture up for one world stuff. So globalism will seem to solve many modern problems. And it's going to be embraced in, in many ways. But there's going to be a huge price tag attached to it. And the reason that Americans are some of the slowest people in the world to yield themselves to it is because of our Christian roots. We have a, a, a large part of generations that are still alive that have a biblical knowledge and understanding. And as a result, th these things have not been able to take root here um, near as quickly. But they're trying. Now, uh, go back to Revelation for a moment. And let me show you the price tag that's going to go with this one world system. Once everyone is numbered, everyone's identified. Re Revelation 14 and 9 says, The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and the mark, or excuse me, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture upon the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now that's some strong language. Now why... Are those that receive the mark in their forehead or in their hand, we know that that mark of the beast, when it comes, you'll not be able to buy or sell or so forth. It's obviously going to be a digital form of currency. And we say, why is the, why is the wrath of the Lord going to be poured out on it? Because that's going to be the worldwide system in place when Armageddon breaks loose. Interestingly, the Real ID Act contains provisions in it for everyone to be fingerprinted and eye scanned. It's not being fully implemented yet, but it's in the act. And again, it's going to, and again, I, I find it fascinating. We, we know the, the, the fascinating thing of the uniqueness of fingerprints and so forth. But long before that, long before anyone, certainly John knew anything about it. He saw it in a vision that was coming. There's going to be a mark in their hand and in their eye, in their head, their forehead. Uh, the mark of the beast will be needed to buy or sell. Again, it's obviously going to be digit, digital. Sweden has already become in a cashless society, and it's happening fast around the world. Again, America is dragging our feet because we have biblical training and teaching. But the more that subsides, the more uh, things flow forward. So let's go back. Uh, to that Revelation 13 beast again. Bring up slide two back up again if you would. Now remember this thing is going to have seven heads and ten horns. And it's the final culmination of a vision that John saw and both Daniel both had visions. And it's a combination of, of the four beasts of Daniel only without the eagle. Now again as we've discussed, American eagle is not there. But we're not told why. And there could be some bad reasons it's not, or there could be a good reason that it's not. I'm hoping it's the good reason. <clears throat> but I don't know. Uh, the prophecy is that all these end-time governments will come together to form one globalized beast. And the entire world will worship it. They will wonder about it. They will be in awe of it. Because never before has anything been seen like it. And it'll be celebrated as man's greatest achievement. It will be the culmination of the Star Trek effect. We're going to get to where Captain Kirk was trying to get us. <laughs> or, or whoever you want to choose. John's vision, however, was to the people of God. It was to Israel. 
It was to the church. It was people that know him. And he was basically telling the church and, and, and Israel, said, I want you to see what's coming. It is going to happen. I want you to know in advance that it's going to happen so you can prepare yourself for it. But it is also there to prepare your faith to understand that all the times when injustices occur and all the things that happen, we ask God, why, Lord, when are you going to take care of this? Uh, it's coming, my friend. It's coming. And it's important in the meantime that we don't get deceived by all this mess. That we don't chase after this stuff. Bring up Matthew 24. <clears throat> Notice what he said. He said that if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and they shall grow, show great signs and wonders, insomuch, if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he's in the secret chambers, believe it not. We're not here to try to chase messiahs anymore. We got one already. <laughs> and everything that comes after him is a falsity. And so we're, we're, we're warned about all this, so we're not sucked up into the vortex of the emotion and all that's going to be going on in these last times. I want you to realize that the only structure in place, not only now, but in the history of the world, that could handle a globalization effort is the United Nations. And like many things, uh, it was started with good intention. I mentioned briefly last session, let me note it again tonight. Uh, in World War I, in the early part of the 20th century, there were 8.2 million people that were killed during that war. You have to understand, up until that time, there had never been anything like it. The largest amount of people that were ever killed in any one kind of a war or conflict was less than one million. Worldwide in history. All of a sudden, in the 20th century, 8.2 million are killed in one war, and they said it was the war to end all wars. Boy, that turned out to be wrong. Never again shouted that, that generation... And so they started the beginning of a thing called the League of Nations. And it was created in order to endeavor to bring a global security so that the world would never face this again. But we know that the world did face it again. President Woodrow Wilson was in favor of joining this, but the American Congress, again, I believe much to do with its biblical training from many of them in Sunday school, refused to, to vote to be a part of this League of Nations in the beginning. And their argument that they gave was we're not going to give up our national sovereignty. But just 20 years later, everybody say 20 years, all of a sudden World War II breaks out. And by the end of World War II, it was not 8.2 million people that were left dead. It was 52 million people worldwide. That means 60 million people in just four decades of the 20th century, when up until that century, no more than a million had ever been killed in any one conflict in thousands of years. And so people cried out and demanded an answer. President uh, Roosevelt at the time did take strong actions. He Put, he was the one, as we noted, that put the, the, the words New World Order on the back of the American dollar, still there today. Stalin and Churchill and Roosevelt got together at Yalta to begin the, the writing of a charter concept that was going to be called the United Nations. Bring up slide three. An interesting character that played a big part of this is a guy by the name of Alger Hiss. And he would go on to serve as the first Secretary General of the United Nations. Now, he was an American. And because President Roosevelt's health was failing, he was uh, assigned by Roosevelt to represent America in all of the delegations and all of the things. His, foot, his fingerprints, if I can say it that way, are all over the United Nations. He was involved in the writing of it. He was involved in making agreements on, on behalf of America and so forth. <clears throat> so much so 
that it raised a lot of questions. And people wanted to know how, how in the world did, did Russia get so many concessions when they lost the war? You know, usually to the victor goes the prize. And yet Russia ended up with more concessions, equal power with the United States. And, and, and the more they delved into it, the more they began to investigate. It took three years, but three years later, after the beginning of the United Nations, uh, he was arrested and convicted as a Soviet spy. Wasn't that beautiful? <laughs> Having somebody that high up in the echelons of our government. Now, the reason it's important is because this tells you of the mindset and the ideology behind the United Nations. Uh, when he was putting it together, because Roosevelt was, uh, health was failing, he was, uh, he was in essence uh, in a dying pattern, uh, Hiss led it all. And they gained so many concessions. Bring up uh, slide four. Uh, and, and one of the concessions, and, and of course we found this out later, this was Hiss's work right here. To the left, you see the logo of the Soviet Union. To the right is the logo of the United Nations. One thing you'll notice is that the wheat sheaves are identical. That's because Hiss designed it that way. Only he didn't tell people why he was designing it that way. He, he obviously didn't put the hammer and the sickle in it because that'd be too overt and too obvious, but his intention was laid out. Uh, and of course they never did change it, which I find even more amazing at, even after they found all this out. So you have a United Nations that was written by a so greatly in, in, in influenced by a Soviet spy with American power. And that's really his vision right there. The, the, he wanted a blend of Soviet style communism throughout the world. He wanted the Warsaw Pact to be something that would come, become global. But when John, under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, saw the end times, he said he saw that one of the seven heads was wounded and almost dead. Not dead, but almost dead. And then it was amazing. Uh, Revelation 13 and 3, if you'll bring it up. I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. Everybody say healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. So the question is, what is this? Well, it is very, very possible that we have seen it all unfold in the 20th century. Let me throw an idea by you. The United Nations was formed in 1945, but it had a very, very, very shaky start. Again, Russia had received so many concessions from Alger Hiss that it appeared that Russia was going to rule the, the, the Europe. And it appeared that, there, that they were basically communism was going to dominate uh, throughout Europe. That is what the whole Cold War was about. It was that America and Western allies responded. And because it was already set in the United Nations, and Russia had as much veto power as America had, there wasn't a lot that could be done on a UN level. And so America uh, started something called NATO, which, by the way, we have many of their offices right here in Norfolk. But it's the North American Treaty Organization. And the whole purpose of this was to counter the Warsaw Pact and to keep communism at bay and, and to keep it from happening. So basically, when the... When NATO rose up against the Warsaw Pact, it was called the Cold War. We were not in a shooting war, but we were in a war on every other level. And some of you that remember the Cold War remember the nuclear drills and all kinds of things that, that, were, that were taking place. But it was basically, what it did is it put the UN into neutral. They were functioning, but they really didn't have any real power. Because the power was, all the power in the room was being uh, sucked up by Russia and America through NATO and the Warsaw Pact. Then, uh, going back to the beginning of it, America would not join it, a world government, unless it had absolute veto power. So we're not just going to lay down our sovereignty. 
Now, I, I'm fearful that we're coming into a generation that is willing to lay down our sovereignty. But in the beginning, when America stood for this, Great Britain, China, Russia, and France, which were big nations at the time, all demanded it as well, ended up getting it to bring it all about. And these five nations became permanent members of what you and I know as the UN Security Council. And they can veto anything. So any resolution that comes up, any one of those five nations on the Security Council can veto it. So it, it, keeps, it keeps the UN in check in a lot of ways. What I think is going to happen, and it would not take much to make that change, if that veto power goes away and an agreement comes together, then all of a sudden the UN is loosed with full power upon the earth. Now again, when you review this, you got seven beasts of Daniel 7 merged into one beast with seven heads in the book of Revelation. The beast, which most of the time in biblical prophecy represents a government or a kingdom, uh, we, we, we believe that the beast of Revelation 13 is this one world government. Or the only thing that we would call it in our time so far, the closest thing to it is the United Nations. Now after World War II, the world recognized that there was something wrong with Germany <laughs> because they, they, they were a warmongering people. And they, they have now gone through three Reichs and kingdoms would rise up and fall down. The Roman Empire rose up, but they kept creating throughout Europe a state of war and, and uncertainty. And so if we had not won World War II, as the saying goes, we'd all be speaking German tonight. But that wasn't going to happen because John's vision said, no, it's going to have the mouth of the lion, not the mouth of the leopard. But it will have the body of a leopard, which is Germany and Europe. So what happened is, after the World War, to keep Germany from becoming a power, on that level again, Germany was divided into two, East Germany and West Germany. And the thinking behind it is we're going to cut their finances in half, their economy in half, their military in half, enough that they are not going to have the power to wage this kind of war. One will be led more by NATO, the other by communist forces. But over time, bring up slide five. Uh, the headlines, by the way, when this happened back in the day is Germany isn't dead. She will never rise again. It was considered that the German people would never rise up to be a world power again. And when they divided the city, they ended up building the Berlin Wall. Now, the Berlin Wall was established in 1961. It was built by the communists to keep people in. You ever notice when socialism and communism gets into their full bloom, people want out. But they're not allowed to go out, so they get shot. That's what makes me so angry about the young people of America today. They're, 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 they're so un, unfazed by history. They think they got a bead on things. And this, this isn't... When I see a man like Bernie Sanders getting the kind of traction that he's getting in America, I'm telling you, George Washington is rolling over in his grave at the utter nonsense and foolishness that is being entertained by the younger generation. But that's because the generation is further away from biblical teaching. They don't have a biblical worldview. And unfortunately, they don't even have a historical worldview. And I don't mean that to be smart. I mean, literally, they, they, they don't. Every thing that they hold up as an example is falling apart in front of them, yet they refuse to relent. So people wanted to get away from the communist side, and they kept fleeing to western Berlin. So the communists built a 29-mile-long wall. And not only did they establish 
uh, on August 14th, the, the picture that you're seeing. It was built by the Soviet Union. We're going to keep people in. It was the Berlin Wall, but they also created another thing you've heard in history called the Iron Curtain. And that was throughout Europe. It was a set of lookout points from the communist side. It was always by the communist, always by the socialist, to keep people in. Just like they're doing in North and South Korea right now. Ain't nobody in South Korea trying to break into North Korea. <laughs> but if you gave the North Korean people the chance, they'd flee like crazy to get away from the, from the terrible stuff of communism. And this 29-mile wall was a separation between Eastern and Western Europe. And this is what many scholars believe is the deadly wound that John saw come upon one of the heads of the lion. If you remember on the lion... It had four kingdoms, five kingdoms, but one of them had four heads. And that's the, the, because each head represented a rise and a fall of its kingdom. And Hitler was the leader of what was called the Third Reich. The word Reich in German is head. So it literally is, if, if this isn't the fulfillment of John's vision, then it ought to be. Because it's stunning how world events have come around to match it. Unlike anything else. No other book calls this kind of stuff before it happened. Let alone thousands of years before it happened. Well now, in the middle of the 21st century, we have a new problem. Now we've invented nuclear weapons. And the world has enough nuclear arms to wipe out all the life on the planet. So something now has to be done to create a structure in order to keep world order because we can't afford this crazy stuff to get out of hand because now it ain't going to be 60 million that's going to die. It's going to be billions that are going to die. And so the goal was to keep national borders the same. That's actually one of the goals of the United Nations is that, look, everybody just, just be happy with what you have and stop trying to be an aggressor to take over other countries. And, 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 and not only that, we're going we're to push that and we're also going to try to keep third world dictator nations from getting nuclear weapons because we can't trust them. They're nuts. <laughs> and that's why we're fighting right now to keep Iran. I promise you, you don't want to see Iran get nuclear weapons on. U.S. Deputy Secretary of State, back in 1968, was a guy by the name of George Ball. He wrote an article about the divided Germany, and he said this, It is the division that festers like a rusty knife wound that must someday be healed. So again, it, it usually represents kingdoms. So the first kingdom had four heads, four rises and falls. Germany had the Third Reich. Hitler's Germany was wounded. It was knocked down, defeated, and then cut in half. Germany did not disappear. It did not die. But it had a deadly wound that was meant to keep it from ever rising up again. And now there is a Fourth Reich that will rise up in order to fulfill all of this scripture. And one thing we know is this Fourth Reich will be a major player in the New World Order and the United Nations. And when it happens, the world's going to be in awe of it. Europe is finally going to have peace because most of this damage and killing and bloodshed has been on the European continent. And it's going to be noted as the greatest thing. So now, in order for this to happen... The wound has to be healed. Bring up slide six. In 1986, and I remember watching this on live television when it happened. This 20, the, 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 the Berlin Wall is called the 29-mile wound that won't heal. 
President Reagan stood in front of the Berlin Wall and made a speech and challenged before the world. Uh, it's a famous thing. You can Google it or uh, YouTube it. It's simple. But he, he challenged him. He said, Mr. Gorbachev, bring down this wall. Now, behind the scenes later in history, it was recorded that the advisors did not want Reagan to say that. He had it in his draft. He had written his, his speech draft. And they said, no, no, you've got to take that out of there. It's too provocative. He said, why? It, 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 you're going to start a war. It's, you're, you, you can't do it. You're gonna. And so he said, well, okay. And then later when he got up, <laughs> he exercised uh, what you call executive authority. <laughs> and he put it in anyway. <laughs> And just kind of felt inspired. And by the way, I have no doubt that he was. I actually think it was inspired. I think it was Holy Ghost inspired. As a matter of fact, I probably bet that President Reagan felt such an anointing on him right at that moment that he didn't care if they launched nuclear weapons. <laughs> Mr. Gorbachev, bring down this wall. <sighs> the media about fell over. My God. Everybody remember in 1985 when Gorbachev came out of nowhere? And every Soviet leader was so unbendable. And all of a sudden, Gorbachev arrives on the scene. And he begins to negotiate with Reagan, bring about what would become the end of the Soviet Empire. Russia, of course, is still obviously in full existence, but Mr. Reagan challenged him to bring down the wall. And then later, this bottom picture, November 9th, 1989, you see the president as one of the first ones there with a hammer and chisel to start tearing down the Berlin Wall. There was a party like never before. Some of you that were alive remember this incredible time. What we may not have understood is we may very well have been seeing prophecy being unfolded on worldwide television because many believe that is on that day from 1961 to 1981 there was a 28 year old wound to the German beast that became healed when the Berlin Wall came down they started pouring from East Germany into West again no one was running from the west to the east. <laughs> Some of you may remember, they even gave all the people that were coming from the east to the west $600 spending money. You had to because they were under socialism. They didn't have nothing. <laughs> that glorious system. They gave them $600 to celebrate, and celebrate they did. They danced all over that wall. Go on later tonight or tomorrow, next day or two. Go on YouTube and, and Google some of that stuff out. Find it. Watch the videos. You want to see a, an exuberant European people that were finally being set free from communism and socialism. Then, just 20 days after, the fall of the wall as a wound that became healed. Bring up slide seven. Gorbachev, George W. H. W. Bush, Pope Paul, John Paul II, who, by the way, many of you know historically, was a major political player in those days. Probably one of the most uh, beloved and famous popes, certainly of the 21st century, or 20th century. They met in Malta and came together and they, they worked on an announcement that they made just 20 days after the fall of the Berlin Wall. For the first time, they announced this is the beginning of a new world order. That's why George H.W. Bush, when he became president after Reagan, was the first one, the first president that I remember started to openly talk about a new world order. It was all because the beast had finally been healed. The head had been healed. And it was coming together. Now, 
we go back to the future. <laughs> and notice in our current day, one of the things that President Trump ran on was uh, he was just simply saying America first. Well, they, they interpret that as nationalism. And they're interpreting as nationalism as being a dirty word. Even though that's how all nations operated for thousands of years of human history. Now, the Trumpster, in my mind, is not trying to take over the world. <laughs> and so when he says America first, he's not trying to start World War III. Though you would think so if you listen to some media. But he was criticized because you can't put America first. That's nationalism. And nationalism is a dirty word in the 21st century because we're not living in the time of nationalism. We're living in the time of globalization. Globalization is the thing that's it. Now, by the way, the Trumpster, whether he's reelected or not, he's not going to stop all this. But he is slowing it down. And I believe that's all about timing. But globalism in our time is considered a more lofty ideal than nationalism. As a matter of fact, people start hearing somebody like him say, I'm going to put America first, I'm going to make America great again. That's why they've all been trying to liken him to Hitler and calling him Hitler and calling him a Nazi and all this other kind of stuff. He said, you're, you're trying to do what Hitler did. You're trying to make America into a Germany. You know, it might be well to note, America's history in our 250 whatever years it's been has never had a history like that. As a matter of fact, we've been solving more world problems than we've been creating. I know we've created some, <laughs> but we've solved more than we've created. Now, the thing you need to understand is that attitude that's here today did not just come out of nowhere. It has been brewing for a hundred years. We are in the global, new global era. And we're moving from national state to world government system thinking. That's the idea. And... Again, globalization has been specifically planned for for many, many decades. But it didn't start in earnest until the early 20th century. Remember, uh, remember the, bring up slide eight. You remember those spheres I showed you in the last session that was built for Vatican at Rome? It's a, it's a, a tribute to the New World Order, a world uh, ascending a sphere within a sphere. Uh, it's ascending from a new world order, ascending out of the old world order. The two most prominent ones, they have several of them now, but the two first prominent ones was in Rome at the Vatican, which I think actually is that picture there. And then there's another one like it in New York City in the front yard of the United Nations. Because there's a partnership between the UN and Rome. Now here's why this is interesting. Bring up Revelation chapter 17. Goodness gracious, I'm running out of time. I was worried. I was going to try to get through six pages. I'm, I only made it to th through three. <laughs> she come oh shy. I'm ready for next Bible study already. <laughs> Bring up Revelation 17. Now here, here's why this is interesting. Think about this. And there came one of the seven angels which had seven vials and talked with me saying unto me, Come hither and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon the waters. Other verses, it was a harlot. Same thing. With whom the kings of the earth, governments, have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, 
having seven heads and ten horns. Notice the beast that the woman's riding is the one world government. Slide nine. Again, this is a, an artist's rendition of perhaps something similar to what John saw in his mind. Now, the woman who is the harlot of Revelation was riding on the New World Order. It is commonly felt, and I believe with huge strong reasoning, that the woman is a representation of Catholicism in the Catholic Church around the world. It is a power unto itself, complete with embassies. It's the only church in the world that has political embassies in nations all over the world. Now, if, if that is true, consider that in light of, go back now to the fourth verse, and think about this. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, which, by the way, are the chief colors of the leadership of the Catholic Church. Decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Still sounds like them. <laughs> Having a golden cup in her hand full of abomination and filthiness of her fornication. And, and if you know the history of the Catholic Church, it is, it is vile. Both for its immorality as well as for its bloodshed. And as I preached last Sunday for its effect on, on the, the, the weakening of the Acts 2 church. Listen to the video to understand that. <laughs> Verse 5, And on her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, and when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. The, the Greek word would have probably been better translated in our time with great wonder. I was just like, wow. Because again, John never seen anything like this. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which hath seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. He said, it was, then it went away, but it came back. Now, hang tight for a minute. Uh, okay, and shall go un into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names, now watch, were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. So whatever's being described here at the moment does not include the church because the church's names are written in the Lamb's book of life. They said, and when they beheld the beast that was and is not and yet is, again, the wound healed. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The, heaven, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Bring up slide nine again. The beast, he said the, the thing to understand about it, according to what John was writing, the angel told John, he said you need to understand something about the beast. Its representation comes from the seven mountains upon which the woman sitteth. It's almost, there's a few places in the world that are built on what they call Seven Hills. Seven, one of them, by the way, is a place called Seven Hills, Ohio, but I don't think that's in Bible prophecy. <laughs> but ironically, the city of Rome, Italy, is built on seven mountains. And he said, the woman sits on that city. The Catholic Church is, the beast that she's riding is the revived Roman Empire. The empire that was and then was not, and now yet it is. 
disappeared and it's become now now it's called the Holy Roman Empire because the, the Catholic Church has been attached to it. And the Vatican, basically, I believe what's being prophesied here is going to ride on the power of the New World Order. And it is going to make a note where I was. <laughs> And it is going to uh, be energized and powered by Antichrist. It's going to be interesting. We'll pick up part four in the next session. Would you stand with me tonight? Hallelujah. Folks, we're watching history before our eyes. More importantly, we're watching biblical prophecy before our eyes. If no, you don't get nothing else out of their teaching, you need to, need to, we need to quit goofing around with our soul. That's, that's really what the whole point of this is. Clap your hands to the Lord. Give him a shout of praise tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I loose this teaching into the church. Let it be a blessing in the name of the Lord. Give him praise. Give him glory. Give him honor.